Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Haksameak from Kentucky. And we haven't got our sukkah up, so I had to put this one up behind me. Um, but uh, we're putting it up later. It came late last night. Um, I'm just thrilled that you're all here, and I want to thank Rose for the, the music. It got me all fired up. She, I don't know if she knows, but that's one of my favorite songs. The, um, the Jubilee. The... Uh, Elijah song. A lot of the people here haven't got internet where they are, and we weren't sure if we'd have internet last night, so we were scrambling around here doing that as well. So today is August 20th, the first day of the Feast of Sukkot, and we are all keeping it, some at home, some in different places. I'm here with Ella. Um, I want to keep saying Kate. It's, it's Kim Tate because I've combined your name. We are talking about acronyms last night. Um, Yvette, Janet, Ella, uh, and Eric. I've got Eric in the house. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exciting. It's exciting. We are looking forward, and Mayor's coming over here later. So, But Ella has made so much food that I'm bursting just looking at it. And we spent four hours just bringing the food in last night. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, they are trying to hook up to the TV downstairs so we can see if we can do that. I'm not sure if they got it going. We, um, I met Shane in Niagara Falls. He gave me my new Colorado hat. That's why I'm wearing it. So that's what that's about. And Shane is up in Maine, um, but I don't know if he's tuned in today or not. And I had to drive through a flood to get here. Now, I want to say this so that all of you know what why did jehovah give the holy days why did he give the sabbath he gave them as a test he says i'm giving them manna as a test to test my people why does he want to test you he wants to test you so that he knows your heart he wants to test you so that he gets to know you how strong are you? How far can he push your limits before you break? So the holy days, and this year, again, all the holy days this year was a test. I left Sunday afternoon to start driving south here uh, to meet Shane in Niagara Falls, and then from there down to Kentucky. And I had to drive through a flood. I mean, the windshield wipers on high speed, driving at five miles an hour, and I still couldn't see the road. The streets were flooding, the highways, people were driving too fast, they were spinning out because they were hydroplaning. And should I go? Should I cancel? Should I just go away? My wife comes down with COVID on Friday, uh, yeah, no, Wednesday, and it's full blown on, on Friday. Do I leave? I call her on Saturday, I call her on Sunday, are you getting better? Do I go home? She says, I'm better. It's a test. Are you going to keep the feast? You know, what is it that's going to break you to cause you not to keep the feast? What is that thing? Is the pressure from work? How much pressure? You know, I remember when I was the only one in the world that could do my job. I'm still the only one that could do it, but now they got a hundred other people doing the exact same job. How did that happen? Am I really indispensable? Yes, you are. No, they can replace you with anybody tomorrow. So those times when I thought I was going to get fired, when I thought I was going to lose my career, the next day or after the feast, I came back, guess what? I just had a week or two weeks off and I come back and I got a promotion. I got a better assignment. I got more pay. It was a test. The week before Sukkot, it was killing me. Do I keep it or do I not keep it? And I put so much pressure on myself. The week after Sukkot, everyone forgot about, you know, they didn't know about any pressure at all. The job still got done. The weather, the disasters. What is it that's going to keep you away? 
So these holy days are designed by Jehovah to be a test. Now, every year, just before the feast, we go through this time period of chaos, utter and total chaos. All hell's breaking out. We can't think, we can't function, and we're going to stay home, not keep the feast. So I did that my first year. I caved into the pressure. It was brand new. I didn't know what I was doing. I'll just stay here and go to work. For the next three, four years, that keeping the Sabbath and the holy days became very hard as the test. Because I flunked the test, I now had to redo the test, but it was harder. Because Jehovah wants to know, are you going to keep it or not? So I did, and I passed the next test, and then I passed the one after that, but they were hard. Until finally I resolved it in my brain, come hell or high water, I am going to keep this feast. I'm going to keep this holy day. And if I don't know which day it's on, I'm going to keep both days. And I'm going to determine in my brain to take that time off work, two days if I have to. And that's what I started to do. And when the Day of Atonement could be combined in and take three weeks off of work, I did that. Just booked off three weeks. I don't care if all this job has to get done because of me. I don't care. I'll get it done when I come back. I've been divorced. This is my 40, what is it? 44th feast, 43rd feast. I've been divorced almost 43 times. I've almost had all my clothes thrown on the street 43 times for keeping the feast. I've almost lost my job. Well, I've been retired now four years, so 39, 39 times, right? Again, it's a test. It's all a test. And the chaos that goes before it, we had a video. I sent out a video on Friday because I heard about a number of people going through all kinds of trouble and they were about to pack it in. And I said, it's a test. And I showed them this, what I'm telling you all today. It's a test. All those tribulations that you thought you had at the end of Sukkot, when you go back, they'll disappear. The people that were bringing them will have forgotten them. So I'm telling you this, all of you this, so that you know it's a test. Look at the 10 days of awe. We know that's a time of judgment. We know that's the 10 years of awe. And that leads into, right after the 10 days, five days later or five years later, the wedding ceremony. Well, it's not five years. It's going to be another at the end of the seventh. But the pattern is there. The trials, the tribulations, the testing, the judgment, and then the wedding. So now we're in the feast that represents the wedding. You're going to get a phone call. Someone, there's an emergency. It's another test. Are you going to keep the feast? You have to decide. And that's what's being done right now. We're all going through it. Everyone in the room, well, I'll say house, because they're no longer in this room. They've, they've all left the room. But everyone in this house is being tested. You know, I asked everybody. They were going through chaos and trial, all of them, before they came. And then, I'm just going to go. I don't care anymore. I'm just going to go. I need to get away from this madness and go. And now, the madness is disappearing. So here we are. So if you're going through that, be blessed, because that's the trial that Jehovah is doing to you. And again, for me, am I keeping the feast at the right time? Am I wrong? Should we have kept them next month? Or should we have kept them two months from now? Every time I do this, I go through that same procedure all the time. Am I right? Am I wrong? I don't know. What do I, how do I know? I look back over, was the barley of Eve? Yes, the barley was the Eve. Then this is the seventh month. Okay. Where are the, the other fruits? The barley, the wheat, the grapes, the dates. Not the dates, the pomegranate. I haven't checked the dates yet. I don't know if the dates are ready now. Um, the pomegranates and the figs, they're already in the fifth month. So 
again, it's, it's a test. Are you going to obey? So, okay, yeah, so Glenn just put in the, 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 the chat there. So each time you complete a test, <clears throat> each time you complete a cycle, <coughs> You are summoning yourself. You are proving to Jehovah that you are committed to him. It's like the woman walking around the bride seven times. That walking around the, the groom seven times is done before the wedding is complete. And we are doing that each time we keep the Sabbath, each time we keep the seven annual feast, the sabbatical cycle, the seven days of Sukkot, all those things. That's why this is important. And it, as hard as it is, show up. And suddenly, all of a sudden, it becomes easy. I don't know why, it just is. So we're gonna do the, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation. Um, as I prepared this PowerPoint presentation, I got surprised at some of the things I learned. This one, and especially the next one. So if you fall asleep today, make sure you don't fall asleep next on the chimney after that. And if you fall asleep today, you're going to miss the most important points. Which ones? Oh, whenever you fall asleep. So, um, I, Shauna, I, who, uh, Glenn, I'm going to ask Glenn. I don't know who's doing opening prayer, but can I ask Glenn to do that for us? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Yep. Almighty Father, great creator God, we're gathered here on your first day of Sukkot, commemorating the wedding feast. This is a great day. We love this day and we thank you for it. It's the beginning of our um, time commemorating the wedding feast coming in the millennium reign. And we look forward to it so much to get rid of the weight of this world and the weight of the problems and we thank you for getting us through this past week and through the 10 days of awe to get us here we made it we're here Whew. it was tough and we appreciate your help behind it we love you we're showing you we love you we are going to pursue with all our being but we need your help to get through it always but we're here and we thank you we ask you to be with us today uh, in spirit and in uh, our hearing and understanding so that we can get more um, information from you in how we can continue to walk in the way. We appreciate you. We love you, Jehovah, our God. And through your son, Yeshua, Hamashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. So coming down, um, I seen two trees that had branches that were red. One was in Ohio and the other one was in Pennsylvania. I said, this is awesome. Again, another confirmation that we're not early, we're right on time. So anyway, that's I, just my little thing. I will say that, if I may interrupt, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm attached to nature and the earth because of the nature of my business. And I have been watching, obviously, to make sure that I'm doing the right things from the start of the Aviv Barley. And it, every time something comes up, I'm looking, I'm saying, is this right? Is this right? And so far, everything that I've seen is aligning just like it does every year. Well, since 2016, actually. Um, and it's, it is the right timing. I mean, the, the harvest here in New Hampshire, and I can't speak to anyone else, is coming along as it always has on time in conjunction with the, uh, the feasts that we've determined to be by the barley. And here we're starting to see some of the color changes. You asked me that uh, a few days ago, Joe, and there is some changes. There is but it's normal. This is normal. The stressed plants are starting to turn um, and the fruits and the vegetables are all coming in. Yeah, they might be a week early here, a week early, late here. 
it's all within like two weeks of normal timing. So I just want to let you know that's confirmed for me here. The pumpkins are turning orange. This is normal time right now. I can't imagine going another month. They'd be rotten in the field. So take it at least from where I am. You'll have to assess yourselves where you are. But I say we're on time. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just keep keep the people. I don't know if it's raining there where Glenn is. It doesn't look like the Corona family are building a suka. So, but the, they're supposed to be having a lot of rain coming up through New York and Connecticut and Maine up there. So uh, keep the uh, the feast state up in Maine in your prayers. They don't get washed out. So, okay, I'm going to start. I got a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to get started on that. We're going to go to around, uh, it's already 11.30. Go to about 12.30 my time. So that's about an hour from now. We'll take a break. I got to eat some of Ella's food, get rid of that. So we don't have to carry it all back out. And uh, then we'll come back at uh, one o'clock my time, which is two, an hour, two and a, what's that? Two and a half hours from now, an hour and a half from now. And we'll do the rest of the uh, teaching in the afternoon. So um, share screen. What am I doing here? Okay, hang on a sec. I got to get out of this. I did have it ready, and now I got a bunch of other stuff ready. There we go. Okay. Somebody just, can you see that, Kim? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Ella and Kim, I, I'm having trouble hearing with these. So if somebody's yelling at me, just let me know. Okay. Okay. So we're we've we've already taught you some of the things that we we are going to talk about today. But I want to start adding up all the puzzle pieces. I sent you a piece of the puzzle in the newsletter this week. The picture behind me is part of that puzzle. What is the answer? All right. So. We're going to go through that. The Mikra, the Mikra. So we are in the Feast of Booths and we go through this all the time. We go to the scriptures. Where, why are we doing this? Where does it come from? Leviticus 23, verse 33. And Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of the Tabernacles for you seven for seven days to Jehovah. Now I forgot to go out last night and look at the the moon. We forgot to do that. We got talking, we got talking. Then there it came. We got talking. Oh, we talked till over midnight and they once had to get up. You know, we still could have been talking all night long. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, which you talk all day long, all night long. You shall do no work of labor. Seven days you shall offer a fire offering to Jehovah. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall offer a fire offering to Jehovah. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no work of labor. These are the feasts of Jehovah. They're not the feasts of Job. They're not the feasts of the Jews. They're not the feasts of any group. These are Jehovah's feasts, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer a fire offering to Jehovah, a burnt offering and a food offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. Verse 38, Leviticus 23, verse 38, besides the Sabbath of Jehovah and besides your gifts and besides all your vows and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to Jehovah, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to Jehovah seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath. Did I? Yeah. And you shall take the fruit of majestic trees for yourselves on the first day. Branches of palm trees. Look at the Crone family if they're still there. But look what the kids are doing. And you shall take fruit of majestic trees for yourselves on the first day. Branches of palm trees and boughs of thick trees and willows of the valley. And you shall rejoice before Jehovah your God seven days. So today is the first day. Put it up today. We're going to be doing that here today, right? I got to check with the boss. Ella's the boss here. She's got 
every minute of every day lined up is what we're doing. We don't have time to go to the bathroom, but we're going to get that sukkah up today. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get thrown something here right in the head if I don't watch it. And you shall rejoice. Here's the most important part of this verse. You shall rejoice before Jehovah your God seven days. Not eight days, seven days. There's something else you're going to do on the eighth day. You have your sukkah up for seven days, not eight days. There's a reason. Verse 41. And you shall keep it a feast to Jehovah seven days in the year. It shall be a statute for one week, for a couple days, only when they did it. No, it's a statute forever in your generations. You shall keep it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths seven days. All that are born Israelites shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I made the sons of Israel live in booths when, it, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Jehovah your God, and Moses declared the feast of Jehovah to the sons of Israel. So the newsletter this week, now I forgot to send the newsletter out, so I apologize. But I sent it out as soon as I heard um, when Shane and Mitzi, I met them in Niagara Falls Sunday night, they said, well, how come you didn't send the newsletter? I said, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Anyway, so I sent it out Sunday night. So I apologize for being late. But read the newsletter. There's a good discussion in there about what I've just read. So we are talking about this word, uh, convocation. So this is back to Leviticus 23, verse 33. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Today's the first day. We're meeting here together. We're having a holy convocation. What does that mean? What does that mean? So the word convocation appears twice in these verses. It means a rehearsal. A rehearsal. Jehovah is commanding us, Israel, to rehearse this feast every year. Now, the word rehearse is the word mikra, mikra, Strong's 47-44. Something called out, that is a public meeting, the act, the persons, or the place, also a rehearsal, assembling, assembly, calling, convocation, reading. So a rehearsal of what? He doesn't tell you what it's a rehearsal for. What's it a rehearsal for? So out of that, we go a little bit deeper. The word mikra comes from the word kara, a primitive root rather identical with H7122, which is one we, I believe that's the one we just looked at. No, it's not the one we just looked at. Okay. Um, H172, oh, there it is below through the idea of accosting a person met. What accosting a person met. Hey, hey, Ella, Ella, right? To call out to, that is properly addressed by name, but used in a wide variety of applications. Be ray, self, that are bidden, call forth, call forth, call self, call upon, cry unto, be famous. Guest, invite, mention, name, preach, make, proclaim, proclamation, pronounce, publish, read, renowned, say. H7122, which is where we get the kara from, kara, again, to encounter, whether accidentally or in a hostile manner, befall, by chance, cause to come, upon, fall out, happen to meet. Convocation, mikra, a rehearsal of what? A rehearsal of what? By chance, Jehovah has called you out. Has called you out. He's called you to come here. He called you. And here you are. Why are we here? Matthew 22, 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage for his sons. And he sent out his servants to call those 
there's the word mikra, now I don't know if that's correct or not, to call those who are invited to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatlings are killed and all things are ready, come to the marriage. For many are called and few are chosen. Is that parable having to do with this feast? Who is the groom? Who's the groom? Who's the one calling out? So I've gone to the Jewish wedding and I looked at this Jewish wedding and tried to compare it to what is happening in the Bible with what we're doing here for the feast. So this is a quote from someplace I didn't record it. Until late in the Middle Ages, marriage consisted of two ceremonies that were marked by celebrations at two separate times with an interval in between the two ceremonies. First came the betrothal. So what is the betrothal? Shavuot. This is the uh, Iyurson. And later the wedding, the Nisuin. At the betrothal, the woman was legally married. Although she still remained in her father's house, she could not belong to another man unless she was divorced from her betrothed. The wedding meant only that the betrothed woman, accompanied by a colorful procession, was brought from her father's Adam. house to the house of her groom, and the legal tie with him was consummated. Now that's a summation of everything really quick. He's going to come get her. She doesn't know when. He has to prepare a place for her to come back to. Again, she does not know when. And she's waiting. And at the end of the wedding, then the marriage is consummated. This division of the marriage into two separate events originated in very ancient times when marriage was a purchase, both in its outward form and its inner meaning. Women, women, woman, was not recognized as a person, but as was bought in marriage like chattel. Sorry, ladies. Marriage as uh, with any type of purchase consists of two acts. First, the price was paid and an agreement reached on the conditions of sale. Some time later, the purchaser took possession of the object. In marriage, the, the mohar was paid and a detailed agreement reached between the families of the bride and the groom. This betrothal was followed by the wedding when the bride was brought into the home of the groom who took actual possession of her. Exodus 24, 1. And he said to Moses, come up to Jehovah. So this is going back to Shavuot. You and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and bow yourselves afar off, and Moses alone shall come near Jehovah, but they shall not come near. Neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Jehovah and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice. So this is on the 49th day. They all answered with one voice all the words which Jehovah said we will do. The next day, Shavuot, the 50th day, the Sunday, um, Nadab, Abihu, Moses, and the 70 elders all went up to the top of the mountain and had supper. That's the, the meal that they have to confirm this agreement. Verse 4, Exodus 24, verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of Jehovah, all the contract is what he's doing, the ketubah, and rose up early in the morning and built an altar below the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, peace offerings of bulls to Jehovah. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the ears of the people. And they said, all that Jehovah has said, we will do and be obedient. That's the second time. So this is now taking place on the 50th day. Verse 
Exodus 24, verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Jehovah has made with you concerning all these words. And Moses went up, and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw God. They saw the God of Israel, and there under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as the essence of the heavens for cl clearness. And upon the nobles of the sons of Israel, he did not lay his hands. Also they saw God, and ate, and they drank. This meal is confirming this contract. They now see God, and they're not killed. Verse 12, And Jehovah said to Moses, Come up to me in the mountain, and be there, and I will give you tables of stone, and the law, and the commandments, which I have written, so that you may teach them. And Moses rose up, and his attendant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. So we've got four people in our group here have now been to this mountain, sat, seen the plateau, and ascended up to the higher point where Moses went. It's an amazing place to go. Verse 14, And he said to the elders, You stay here for us until we come again to you. And behold, Aaron and Ur are with you. If any man has any matters to do, let him come to them. And Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of Jehovah abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. So six days after Shavuot, they partied on the mountain. And the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of Jehovah was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the sons of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. That's a time of testing. Testing. Again, what's being tested? Is it Moses or is it Israel? It's Israel. And they flunk the test. Hosea 2.19. And I will betroth you to me. So this is the betrothal. I'll betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you to me forever. And I forgot the rest of the song's words. Yea, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Forever. Jehovah is the groom. Go back here. Who's saying this? Is it Jesus? Is it Yeshua? It's Jehovah. Jehovah is the one we are betrothed to. And it's with Jehovah who will write the covenant on our hearts. It is Jehovah who wrote the covenant on stone and gave it to Moses. We need to know who our groom is or we could end up marrying the wrong man or the wrong spirit. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, says Jehovah. Jehovah says this, that I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I cut with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand. So who took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt? Jehovah did. Who cut the covenant and made, ate with uh, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders? Jehovah did. Which covenant of mine they broke, although I was a husband to them, says Jehovah. But this shall be the covenant that I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my laws in their inward parts and write, <clears throat> write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Who's doing that? Again, it's Jehovah. Jehovah. Verse 34, Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And they shall no more teach each man his neighbor. Yes, I'm done. I don't have to do this anymore. And each man his brother, saying, Know Jehovah, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. So says Jehovah, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the laws of the moon, of the stars for a light by night. 
who divides the sea when, uh, when its waves roar. Jehovah of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says Jehovah, the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. They're still there. The sun is out here. The stars were out last night. The moon was out last night. They're still here. So pay attention to the fact that this betrothal took place on the 50th day. Why is that important? You're going to find out next week. Why is it important? How is it connected to the 50th Jubilee year? And what is the meaning of both of these events? So I'm not telling you the answer today. Think about it. You have to think. Who is the best man at the wedding? Who is the best man? And who are the bridesmaids? So in Greek, the one doing the calling, the one doing the calling for the mikra, remember the mikra we talked about at the beginning, the one is called a paranymph, a paranymph, paranymph. A friend going with a bridegroom to fetch home the bride in ancient Greece, also the bridesmaid conducting the bride to the bridegroom, paranymph resulted from the marriage of the Greek prefix per in the Greek word bride, nymph. The prefix para can also can mean beside or alongside of, as is apparent in the word a parallel from the Greek word parallelos, a union of para and the word alinon, meaning of one another. At one time, the word paranymph also was used for a person who solicits or speaks for another. That is an advocate, but the sense is now very rare. So who is the paranymph? Who's even looking for the paranymph? Everybody's looking for Jesus to come and they want to get raptured out. But nobody's looking for the paranymph because they don't even know what it is. Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him who cries in the wilderness, prepare ye, prepare the way of Jehovah, make straight a highway in the desert for your God, for our God. Malachi 3, 1, behold, I will send my messenger and he will clear the way before me and Jehovah whom you seek shall suddenly come to his people, come to his temp temple, even the angel of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he comes, says Jehovah of hosts. Who's this? Who's coming? Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I'm sending you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Jehovah. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the sons and the heart of the sons to the fathers that I that I not come and strike the earth with utter destruction. So if you don't turn back to Jehovah, if you're not going to listen to him, then he's going to strike the earth with utter destruction. Who's doing that? Who's that paranymph? Matthew, or yeah, Matthew 11, verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the crowds concerning John, what did you go out to, into wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft clothing? Behold, they who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say to you, one more excellent than a prophet, for this is the one of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those who have been born of women, there is not risen a greater one than John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So we have examples of Passover at the Exodus. Then we have examples of Passover, every detail of Passover being played again at Yeshua's crucifixion. We have an example of the paranymph here in John, 
but there's going to be another one when he comes again. The pattern is being shown to you repeatedly over and over, and it's going to be, who is the first paranymph? Moses. Moses and Aaron at the Exodus. The next one was John. I don't know who John's partner was. I, I'm missing that one. But there's going to be two more at the end. Those are the two witnesses who are coming at the end. Are you watching for them? Matthew 72, and he 